Uh, good morning, members of the council. I'm joined today by Dr. Kirsten Turner, our Vice President for Student Success, given the topics that we're going to address today. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you for your leadership and service, especially Aaron, as he mentioned, he visited our campus, spent the day with us, closely listened and shared more about the strategic vision that you would like us to follow, so that's appreciated. It's always good to be with President Jackson. He's done a remarkable job in leading our presidents over the last uh, couple of years. We like to say at the University of Kentucky, our North Star is advancing Kentucky. I arrived here 11 years ago. Some of the uh, certainly names and faces have changed, but this notion of stronger by degrees is something that attracted me to Kentucky. During that first year, we got to celebrate successes and um, enormously proud to work with our sister universities uh, to continue our progress and see the momentum. We want to advance Kentucky such that we can be competitive in growing a workforce that's prepared for a 21st century economy. I'm gonna share information with you today <laughs> that I think indicates significant progress by the University of Kentucky. I would be remiss if I didn't share that this is because of an enormous collective effort. No single unit, no single intervention, no department, no college uh, can move the numbers the way we have. It has taken everybody, and uh, that's what making working at the University of Kentucky such a delight for me. So I'll start with our first key performance indicators dealing with affordability. Okay. So as you look at this slide before you, you can see that we've made uh, progress in unmet financial need, that gap between the total cost of attendance and what students have in the way of scholarships loans and grants. Uh, that has gone down uh, and you can also see coincident with this the time to degree has progressively decreased. I'm pleased to say that when you look at our four, five, and six year graduation rates, there have been appreciable improvements. In a five year graduation, four year graduation, four and five year graduation rates alone, those have moved by over 20 percentage points. So that time to degree, the cost of your education has been able to be reduced over this time. So how do we do these kinds of things? The next slide. I uh, start with our UK Leads program. It's one that has been recognized around the country, being copied by several universities. And it is something we uncovered through deep analytics to better understand our students, all the demographics and financial characteristics that are part of their decision to attend the University of Kentucky and the wherewithal that their families have to support them in that effort. We have invested more into that program. We have triple the amount of funds that we direct to support our students to $160 million, three times greater than it was 10 years ago. This is money that students do not have to pay back. COVID, COVID affected all of us. We recognize a learning loss that took place. It's not just money that keeps those doors open wide to make certain people progress. Have to develop a holistic wraparound service for all of our students. Keep in mind, we haven't changed our admission standards. We didn't achieve student success by making it uh, a little more difficult for students who may be a little less academically prepared or have a steep, steeper financial mountain to climb. We kept the doors open widest for those students. Just like 10 years ago, 25% of our students, the Kentucky students, come from families 
there's an average annual income is anywhere between twenty and twenty-five thousand dollars. Those students really face no tuition and fee costs. In fact, the support we've been able to provide exceeds that amount, giving them the resources to uh, afford the other parts of a college expense. If you look at our uh, undergraduate enrollment numbers, this looks a little peculiar because it seems that our numbers are decreasing. The total enrollment has decreased because of those factors I showed you earlier, that time to degree is much less now. People enter and exit uh, at a much quicker pace. This semester, we recommend, we re welcome in our freshman class a record number, 6,120 students. We had a small dip last year because of uh, COVID. Overall, we stand at a total enrollment of a record 33,000 students. We plan to continue to grow in a smart way so we can service our students, get them in the door, <coughs> out the door, ready to live lives of meaning and purpose. So earlier, um, I talked about our UK LEADS program. I mentioned that our admission standards have not changed. And I'm happy to report as well that when you look within our record enrollments, we have made considerable progress when it comes to our underrepresented students. This year alone, in our freshman class, we had another increase, 7%, such that students of color now represent 16% of our entering class. Overall, underrepresented minority numbers are 18% of our enrollment. Almost 25% of our entering students are first generation. Dr. Turner reminds me when we sit down and talk to these students and understand their perceptions of education, a simple narrative to me is, you know how faculty would say, my, my office hours are eight to 12 on Thursdays and Tuesdays. Many of our first generation students thought that those were the hours that you shouldn't come. That's where a faculty member was working. So this transition for the first generation student requires more of an intense effort and we're committed to it. We also started something that uh, we practiced when we face any kind of challenge at the University of Kentucky. We really accelerated it when we faced COVID. That is Big Table, Big Tent. For COVID, to come up with our strategies to reopen, at one time we had over 500 people around the table. Uh, every week at the University of Kentucky, we started with a handful. There are 50 to 75 people that gather. They come through daily. They use real-time information we've gathered from faculty and counselors and resident assistants to learn about students individually so that we can act quickly. We cannot wait till the end of the semester to try to ensure student success. So that big table, big tent, led by Dr. Turner has proved very, very advantageous to us. We know that we have to graduate students one at a time. We have to individualize our approaches to students. I like to say through this kind of mechanism, we are high tech and high touch. So looking at these key performance indicators of student success, you see that our undergraduate degrees that we award have gone up each year. The dip from COVID, you certainly noticed in the most recent year. And if you look at our graduation rate, it has gone from 64% to nearly 69% this year. These numbers stubbornly stood at around 60% for a decade. We tackled this seriously. And so this holistic approach that I described 
we've been able to move these numbers. Let me put this in a further context. Universities like ours that primarily focus on four-year baccalaureate degrees, there are thousands of them, they're only nearly 20%, really less than 20% that have a six-year graduation rate of 70% or higher. This has been a goal of ours to enter that category. We're almost there. We feel confident that we'll get there within the next year. Again, I have to pause and salute the collective effort of so many people who put our students first in everything that they do. Our retention numbers certainly have to start with retaining those students in that first year. It is so critical. Those have gone up each year. During COVID, we developed something called Health Corps. It was part of our, what we said, modern public health infrastructure. We have had great partners in what we've been able to do at the University of Kentucky. One was Salesforce, the largest customer relations uh, firm in the world. We first engaged them to help us with student success. But once we it, uh, introduced a comprehensive uh, sort of a testing program where we had to isolate quarantine students, provide them services almost instantaneously. We had to build a team of over 50 people who could respond to those students on the real time. Now that we no longer face COVID, we still have that health core infrastructure dedicated to student success. I said earlier that our responsibility, our North Star, is to advance Kentucky. I have to credit Dr. Turner and her team, and I want to turn to her to talk about two interventions. All of these start as pilot programs. We're then able to expand them. Uh, one is our student success navigators. So Dr. Turner, you can speak to those. Sure, happy to. Really, really pleased to be with all of you this morning. So one of the things that we did at um, Health Corps is we had had contact tracers who had been working with our students, our faculty, our staff in all sorts of ways. And as COVID dipped at certain times, you would have those personnel. So we retrained them in what we call them navigators. And what we have found with our data analytics that about a quarter of our students are really at risk. So we do a predictive model on each one. Every single one of our students has a p-value of, of what we think is the predicted value of whether or not they're going to um, progress or whether they're at risk for dropping out. And about a quarter of them have a p-value. It's based on a whole bunch of different variables that has a p-value um, at, at a level that we think they're really at risk for not making it. And so we think through the ways that we can provide the scaffolding or kind of the interventions based on what the data is telling us about those, those particular students and then try to usher in those interventions. We call those students our opportunity students. We don't want to put it in terms of risk, but we, we flag them and we make sure that their advisors and their program um, uh, uh, case managers or anybody who's interacting, their work study supervisor, whoever might be interacting with those students understands that we're trying to um, provide the right scaffolding around them. Well, during COVID and, and, and as we've moved out of it, we've taken those contact tracers and retrained them to something that we've called a navigator. And we've given them caseloads of our most at-risk students. So these, these are the students with the highest, with the highest p-values. And all that those, uh, we did three different pilots with, with, with those navigators. All that person was supposed to do was be somebody who was um, helping them navigate the institution. Because we have a lot of services at the institution. We've got health, we've got counseling, we've got career advising, we've got all sorts of different services. But often that, 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 that large institution can be pretty intimidating. And so the navigator is somebody who enters in with that student and says, let me help you navigate the institution. And what we found with certain things like the student didn't re-register because she had a financial <coughs> hold on her account. And she was so scared to see what that financial hold was that she, she literally was not going to re-register. She just couldn't, couldn't get over the hump of the financial hold. When the navigator walked her through it, it was a $25 fee. That's all it was. Um, and so the navigators are, the, one of the things that they do that's really interesting is they, um, 
They're, they meet the students the moment the student wants to engage. So it may be 25 texts that the navigator has sent and the student hasn't answered. And the student might finally respond at 11 o'clock at night and a navigator's, they're gonna strike. They're like, I've got, I've got, I've got them on the hook. I'm gonna strike right now. So it expands beyond the time of, of a work day or whatnot. These navigators are really, really um, uh, dedicated. But in the pilot projects, what we have found are things like this. Case, the caseloads of our navigators are about 50 to 60 students. They would have had a, that case, would have had a predictive value of retaining those students, the, the likelihood of their, their average predictive value of retaining from first year to second year was about 42%. The only intervention we did was a navigator came in at 83%. So, right, so we, we started doing, we've done three different pilots with these navigators and they work in conjunction with all the other people on the student's care team, their academic advisors, their, their career counselors, their residence hall directors. Um, but we've seen some really good success with these navigators. And so as we're coming out of COVID, we're starting to rethink how can we use those data analytics to do that high touch, particularly for the 25% that, that we see are, are most at risk. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Of course. I'm curious. Um, uh, again, uh, I know a lot about Salesforce because we use Salesforce in our, in our company, so it's kind of interesting. Um, do you track? Uh, I think it's a great, I guess, way. But I was, and you explained, you check that text that they have to connect. To. Yeah. What percentage of students just won't connect because of whatever reason? But do you, I don't know if I have the exact percentage. We could probably find that curious, out. Yeah. But it but is. it is it's interesting because some students will connect immediately, and some you have to. I mean, you have to keep going after it, and and that's where we've learned that when they're ready to connect, you have to strike. You can't answer that twelve hours later. Yeah. You, have, you if they're ready to engage at eleven o'clock at night, you you got to be ready to, to to come right back in. And so you probably have some navigators that um, I guess connect with more. And so do you rate your navigators and or if you have somebody that's not connecting, do you switch out and let another navigator try to connect? We're only in our pilot phase and so we haven't done that, but we have seen that there are some navigators who have a higher um, uh, uh, result yeah. in terms of, so we have um, tried to pick apart, okay, what's the secret sauce going on there? Why is, why is this particular one having such a higher result? The other thing we do is not just with text, about about 88% of our students, first first year students live on campus. So we also can go knock on their door too. So there's lots of, it's very um, multimodal in the ways that we're trying to connect with texts and showing up in their, at their class or showing up at their residence hall seems to be the best, best methods. Here's I know y'all have to finish, but I, I'm sitting here doing some calculations on retention, looking at that big job. And I would have to think that this has a lot to do with it, right? So I'm wondering, have you, when you're collecting demographics, you know, like age, race, right. and some of those other things, are you seeing a correlation between those increases, like with the retention rates and these navigators based on particular demographic groups? Um, we, have, we, I, we have not picked apart that yet. And, and I tell you, because we've only done three small pilots. <clears throat> Um, so I think it has some impact on our retention rates, but I think actually our, there are other things that have had a bigger impact going forward. Where we're going to get the next jump, we think it's with this. So, okay. so we, we think that the, the jumps that we've gotten so far from some other interventions we've done, but we have a pretty good, those pilots before we wanted to shift everything are giving us some ideas that that's where our next jump's going to be. I know we're taking up your time, and I apologize, but I'm really interested when we get a chance, or maybe you just want to quickly say it now, what are all those quote unquote best practices? I know the unmet needs, all that is in there. I'd just be interested in what y'all were doing before, and now those services that you're putting into some regression model, I'm assuming, yeah. uh, to look at the increase, because this is for a research campus, uh, some actually significant percent in growth those are percentage points yeah that's so, right so uh, can you quickly yeah what's help? really what's really interesting is we think about um we bucket everything in four reasons so we're we use a conceptual framework of saying there are four reasons why our students progress or why they might drop out it's around academic issues are they are they prepared for chemistry 105 do they do they know time management do they know how to study 
belonging and, and um, community? Do they feel like they fit? Do they have friends? Do, is this a place that they feel comfortable? Uh, uh, mental and physical well-being. Um, you know, are they healthy? Are they are they sick? And then financial stability. Do they have the money? Are they working three jobs? And we use that predictive analytics. We can isolate. Not some of them are easier to isolate out. So we actually with our with our leads, we target the students where the analytics tell us if it wasn't for money, they would. They, so we were able to really. That's why I think that model is really elegant because it, it targets our finite resources to hey, we can say that the driving factor for this group of students is money. So let's usher in money that way. We are experimenting with how do we do that around belonging? It's a little squishier. And so we've started to play around with, with certain analytics about swipe in, how many, uh, how many um, events are you going to when you swipe in with your ID card? How many um, organizations are you involved in? Are you showing up to meetings? We're, we're, we're playing around a little bit with that with our data analytics and putting that into the overall model that includes all sorts of demographics and things of that nature. Same with health and well-being and same with academics. So are you going to our tutoring center? How many, you know, what are your midterm grades? So we know those intersect, that they're not in isolation, but we've been able to start to think through what are the interventions that can really target What's the driving force for, for particular students? I love how you're taking predictive analytics and turning it descriptive yeah. Yeah. analytics and even, I'm sure, leading to policy change. But you can take all those with demographics, right? Yeah. Those gaps That's exactly as right. an example. And, and I'm taking up your yeah. time. I apologize. This is just too important, I think, for us all not to understand how you're looking. And, and one point I will make on that is when you look at our students, the if you take, say, um, race and ethnicity at a certain level they those students are from um, underrepresented minorities outperform our students if the measurement is uh, uh, persistence and graduation so that tells us uh, around academic preparation that tells us bridge programs are really important right. that if you can get them to a certain level they will actually outperform the other the, the, the larger cohort the same is not true for first gen first gen regardless of income and regardless of academic preparation, continue to lag behind their peers, even when they go into second, third, and fourth year. So they don't make it up as they have more years of a higher ed under their belt. Now that's just for Kentucky students, I'm not, or UK students, I, I, I don't know about other institutions, but that tells us, okay, well, then we gotta do different interventions for our first gen than we do for say, black African-American. Hmm. Well, sorry. You give me a reason to point out our strategic plan begins with putting students first in everything we do. The second pillar is taking care of our people so that it can take better care of everyone who turns to us from our students to all 120 counties where our extension offices are and to the patients who we treat. The third is inspiring ingenuity in everything we do. And many people think that's uh, most reflected by the 400 plus million dollars in research we go out and garner to answer the questions that most trouble Kentucky. But I think what Kirsten just shared with you, we're trying to do it within how we operate and how we serve our students. Many times, you know, we 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 didn't have the power of this analytics, so you. Uh, your interventions were spray and pray. You know, you just got them out there to everybody and you missed. And, and what we're getting better at is being able to, to target and customize our interventions. And I salute uh, uh, Kirsten and her team for doing so. I'll try to get us back on time. Uh, this is the number of our uh, graduates degree, uh, generally uh, uh, increasing over time. Uh, steady in certain areas, uh, fluctuate sometimes with the economy, especially uh, COVID and all, but uh, we continue our ascent. Uh, I wanted to talk about some of the things we've done to make our degrees more accessible. One of those is that online uh, degree programs, we've increased those considerably, had several hundred more degrees a year we now award. We expect that uh, to. As I close, uh, I want to talk about what 
we expect our students to do when they leave the University of Kentucky. That's to be individuals who live a life of being purpose, committed to Kentucky or whatever community where life may take them, and to make us an attractive place for companies and an attractive place where our white creative students can create those jobs of the future. We have been able to do so many things through our partnerships. I mentioned earlier Salesforce. Two weeks ago, Kirsten, two or three others of us made a return trip to Apple, Cupertino. Uh, we were one of their smart campus partners. And I say with great humility, after we shared with them our commitment to Kentucky and why, uh, the sort of worldwide leader on health interventions for Apple um, said it was one of the more compelling presentations he'd heard. Why? Because with another partner, in this case, Fidelity, happens to manage many of our employees' retirement programs. We have teamed up to start a program called UK Invest. Every student at the University of Kentucky by next fall can have an investment account. It will have an app designed for our students by Fidelity. They will have a choice of no load, no fee funds. They have to go through a series of financial literacy uh, programs. We wanted them to start investing in themselves early. With Apple and other partners, we were able to incentivize healthy behaviors, participation in things that we think lead them towards being better citizens when they graduate from the University of Kentucky. So I will close with uh, that spirit of innovation and welcome any of your questions. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, having worked with low income and very low income families for more than one so you guys have to see so many kids go to school and just get lost. And not have so this is, I really applaud you all the children. That's it. One of the questions I did want to ask is in regard to the 25% very low income and the first gen. I see a comment up there about your des first uh, destination career outcome. I was going to ask are you tracking the very low income and the first gen to see what is really happening in their lives after they leave college? Uh, Dr. Turner has uh, some specific data she'll share with. Sure. So our, our first destination and career outcome survey, we, we just implemented in the last couple of years. So I, we don't have longitudinal. But going forward, what we're planning on doing is exactly that. So right now, the, the one that we just finished, we send it to the graduating class um, the, of undergrads about six months after they graduate. We get about a 69, 70% response rate. Of that, of that, the most recent one, about 40% said they're going into grad school or going further in their education. 39% said they're going to the workforce and 20% six months afterwards are saying they're still trying to figure it out. Of the 39, 40% that have went straight into the workforce, about 25% was going to healthcare, about 10% education and about 8% go into engineering or manufacturing. Um, they, about 25% of them respond that they're still in Kentucky. So we, we, this is something that we've just put in, we're putting into place and, and starting to build out, starting to slice and dice it around demographics. And as we've done all this other work to see, has there been impact? So more to come on that. I'm intrigued by the first generation challenges. And I was wondering whether or not it might be a, uh, related to the lack of family support, not only just a lack of you know, we, we've done it before, but you really don't need this. And so that may be something that plays into that um, challenge that they have because not only is it their lack of support, but maybe even a negative impact. I think you will find students that say that, um, and, and that they'll say they have like dual languages or dual cultures that they have to compete against. You'll also see, we see with some first-gen students, <coughs> 
Um, and they're all, they're all different, right? The, so there's not a, a, an overarching type, but you'll also see some that think coming to one semester or one year is I've gone to college. And so you have to give them the goal of four years. So some of the things we've, been, we've um, uh, uh, created is we do a, like a pinning ceremony. Uh, and we do a ceremony after their first year and a ceremony after they've been here for two years and they're halfway through. So you, there's, you have to think through it in a much kind of a, a different way than just assuming that, they, that they're coming for four years or that they've got the family support to do that. Um, there are some first generations that absolutely have that, but, but there are some that we have to rethink the way they, they walk through their entire year. Often they'll say, well, I went, I went to UK, I went to college. I, I, even if it's only for a semester, we're like, no, we gotta get you there. We gotta get you with the degree. We gotta get you to cross that stage. Congratulations. And it's important to understand the first generation now is for, a little bit different than the first generation of my first generation. Plus 25% of those first generation folks, uh, this is their second, English is their second language in many ways. So we're dealing with the multiplicity. And you can actually see a high correlation between first gen and low income. So some of the things that they're talking about here or some of the things we have to discuss as a council, how we move this agenda on first gen, low income. And I think your example is a good example of how targeting, let's say, people of color. I mean, these are, we hear all the time, these are all one and the same. Well, no, they're not. You know, there's distinct differences in the impact or the inputs that are needed. The thing I love about Christian, we want to be the first research one institution that erases that preparation gap, is we all have our own first gen story. If you're not first gen yourself, you can, you, I bet you can tell me where in your line that shifted for your family. And so, um, knowing that the power of a college degree can really shift the, 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 yeah. not just the person but the community from which they come and the family from which they come. So I love the milestones because that is important. They see a new base, see a new understanding. May I ask a question? Go right ahead. D.B. Akins. Uh, I was interested in the retention rate. And I'd like to know how that's how I'm sure it is disaggregated for students of color and further disaggregated for male students of color. What would that look like? Yeah, I, I don't I don't have the male students of color on me. I, I can get it to you for URM students, which is the CPE using the CPE definition for that. Our retention rate is about six percentage points on average over the last five years lower than our overall retention rate. So we've got a gap there that we still need to close. For Black African American, it's about 7%. Um, so it's a little bit higher than the overall uh, URM um, by about a percentage point. We have seen some fluctuation in the last couple of years around our Black females and our Black <coughs> men. Our Black men are lower than our Black females, but our Black females, particularly during what we're seeing, COVID hit the, that, that demographic a little bit harder. So we're trying to unpack what's, what's going on in both of those populations. I, th I, think, I think we have the data that would show that the black males have always been the lower performing than the black females. And so I'm just wondering what targets or initiatives are. <clears throat> Since we know that, what are we doing to mitigate? It's a fantastic question. We've been talking on campus about creating a um, a black male and black female retention office dedicated solely to to those uh, populations. We have a group on campus, a unit on campus that has done a lot of this work. They are in the middle of a, a leadership change. Just a longstanding person has decided to retire, and so we're look, redoubling efforts looking at that particular office in terms of. How, how do we very, in a very targeted way, uh, uh, address the, those gaps in themselves? Any other questions? Dr. Sugar, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you all you. very, very, very much. much.